this video, we should first define what cognitive impairment actually is, at least as far as how it's commonly used today, according to Google National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov. States, problems with a person's ability to think, learn, remember, use judgment, and make decisions. Signs of cognitive impairment include memory loss and trouble concentrating, completing tasks, understanding, remembering, following instructions, and solving problems. Now, of course, notice that little bit in their following instructions. They would say somebody is cognitively impaired when they say uh, don't want their children being indoctrinated or being abused in the school system. And they would also say that somebody is cognitively impaired when they resist a um, so-called police officer when those individuals are enforcing the unlawful and criminal edicts of a corporation acting under the color of law. <laughs> But that is entirely different from somebody who is, say, walking down the middle of the highway completely naked and has absolutely no idea who they are, where they are, or what they are. So those are obviously two different examples of what cognitive impairment is. So if we remove the following instructions portion, it is essentially somebody who has lost their ability to function. Some examples uh, under related health conditions is Alzheimer's disease, progressive disease that destroys memory and other important mental functions. Symptoms may include cognitive deficit, mental decline, difficulty with self-care, so they can't take care of themselves, essentially. Intellectual disability, below average intelligence and set of life skills present, present before age 18. Symptoms may include cognitive deficit, impulsivity, hyperactivity. Down syndrome, a genetic chromosome 21 disorder causing developmental and intellectual delays. Symptoms may include cognitive deficit, learning disability, development delays. Notice that word, all of it has to do with cognitive function. Dyslexia, a learning disorder character characterized by difficulty reading. Symptoms may include cognitive deficit, once again, difficulty spelling, difficulty memorizing. Psychosis, a mental disorder characterized by connection, disconnection from reality. Symptoms may include thought disorder, fear, auditory hallucination. Now this brings us to the main subject in our video called fluorine or fluorine or however you want to say that. But notice the spelling. If you take away the U, you have fluorine, which is a measure, uh, a mark of currency from past centuries. Fluorine is a chemical element. It has symbol F and atomic number nine. It is the lightest halogen and exists at standard conditions as a highly toxic, pale yellow diatomic gas. Fluorine is extremely reactive as it reacts with all other elements except, except for the light inert gases. Symbol F, atomic number blah, blah, blah. Effects on body. What does fluorine do to the body? Fluorine can affect you when breathed in and by passing through the skin. Contact can cause severe eye and skin irritation and burns leading to permanent eye damage. Breathing fluorine can irritate the nose and throat. Breathing fluorine can irritate the lungs causing coughing and or shortness of breath. Here from the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services Hazardous Substance Fact Sheet. Fluorine, uh, DOT number UN1045, NA9192, liquid gas. Hazard summary. Fluorine can affect you when breathed in and by passing through your skin. Contact can cause severe eye and skin irritation and burns leading to permanent eye damage. Same thing that uh, was from the Wikipedia part. Breathing fluorine can irritate the nose and throat. Breathing fluorine can irritate the lungs, causing coughing and or shortness of breath. Higher exposures can cause a buildup of fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema, a medical emergency with severe shortness of breath. Prolonged exposure can cause fluorine to concentrate in the bones, causing osteosclerosis bone pain and fractures, which is recognizable by the density of the bones in x-rays and may be disabling. The teeth can become mottled. Repeated exposure can cause nosebleeds, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, diarrhea, and constipation. Fluorine may damage the liver and kidneys. The effects do not occur when the fluorine is used to treat drinking water to prevent cavities. Yeah, I doubt that. Fluorine is a highly reactive chemical and a dangerous explosive hazard. <clears throat> Identification fluorine is pale yellow to greenish gas or cold liquid with a sharp, irritated odor. It is used as rocket fuel to make fluorides, fluorocarbons, and other chemicals. Notice that one section in there. These effects do not occur when fluorine is used to treat drinking water to prevent cavities. See, that's just a declarative statement. 
where it's saying that they in fact do know that these effects are caused by it and they're telling you they're not without any evidence to support that claim whatsoever because they are doing it with this particular intention of cognitive impairment and we'll look at that later in this video and here it says how to determine if you are being exposed. The New Jersey Right to Know Act requires most employers to label chemicals in the workplace and requires blah, blah, blah. So basically, instead of saying perhaps identifying the symptoms, they say the only way that you'll know that it's exposed is whether or not it's been um, <clears throat> regulated to a certain extent with all of these markings and whatnot. Ways of reducing exposure where possible in close operations and use local exhaust ventilation at the site of chemical release. Local exhaust ventilation or closures not used respirators should be worn of course they don't really have any part in here about how to reduce exposure when it is in fact used in the public drinking water and notice this is fluorine not fluoride and in one passage it said these effects are not present when it's used to treat public drinking water which tells you in conclusion that they do in fact put this in drinking water other long-term effects prolonged exposure can cause fluorine to concentrate in the bones causing blah, blah, blah. Repeated exposure can cause, yeah, we already read that. And once again, they repeat it. These effects do not occur when fluorine is used to treat drinking water to prevent cavities. Pretty wicked stuff they're doing here. <clears throat> Fluor Corporation, F-L-U-O-R, is an American multinational engineering and construction firm and fluoride manufacturer headquartered in Irving, Texas. It is a holding company that provides services through its subsidiaries in the following areas, oil and gas, industrial and infrastructure, government and power. Naturally, that is going to be just like all the other giant corporations owned by foreign investors, <clears throat> where they can implement these acts of terror, destruction, poisoning, toxification, warfare, essentially, and get away with it because they, in fact, are not living in the area that the damage is being caused. Water fluoridation, a critical review of the physiological effects of adjusted fluoride as a public health intervention. Stephen Peckman, Peckham and Niyi Awofeso. I might be saying that wrong. Fluorine is the world's 13th most abundant element and constitute, constitutes 0.808% of the Earth's crust. <clears throat> it has the highest electronegativity of all elements. Fluoride is widely distributed in the environment, occurring in the air, soils, rocks, and water. Although fluoride is used industrial in a fluorine compound, the manufacture of ceramics, pesticides, aerosol propellants, refrigerants, glassware, and Teflon cookware, it is a generally unwanted byproduct of aluminum fertilizer and iron ore manufacture. Notice that the stipulation that it is used in the manufacture of pesticides. The medicinal use of fluorides for the prevention of dental caries began in January 1945 when community water supplies in Grand Rapids, United States were fluoridated to a level of 1 ppm as a dental caries prevention measure. However, water fluoridation remains a controversial public health measure. This paper reviews the human health effects of fluoride. The authors conclude that available evidence suggests that fluoride has a potential to cause major adverse human health problems while having only a modest dental caries prevention effect. As part of efforts to reduce hazardous fluoride ingestion, the practice of artificial water fluoridation should be recognized, re reconsidered globally, while industrial safety measures need to be tightened in order to reduce unethical discharge of fluoride compounds into the environment. Public health approaches for global dental caries reduction that do not involve systemic ingestion of fluoride are urgently needed. Introduction Community or artificial water fluoridation. The addition of a fluoride compound, usually hexafluorosilicic hexafluorosilicic acid, to public drinking water supplies is a controversial public health intervention. The benefits and harms of which have been debated since its introduction in the USA in the 1950s. Discovered by Henri Mosson in 1886, fluorine F is a corrosive pale yellow gas. It is highly reactive, participating in reactions with virtually all organic and inorganic substances. Consequently, fluorine is usually found in soil, air, food, and water as fluorides. Fluorine remained a laboratory curiosity until 1940, when nuclear energy requirements stimulated the commercial production. In industrial settings, fluorine and its compounds are used in producing uranium, plastics, ceramics, pesticides, and pharmaceuticals. 
Fluorochlorohydrocarbons are used in refrigeration and aerosol propellant applications. The impact of fluorine on human teeth was recognized in 1909 in Colorado, United States, when two dental surgeons, Frederick McKay and Grant Black, launched an investigation into the causes of mottled enamel, color, Colorado brown stain, in their practice area. Further studies by McKay, Kempf, and Churchill, uh, water samples in areas in Idaho and Arkansas in 1931 confirmed a link between mottled enamel and high water fluoride levels. From 1931, Dr. Trendley Dean, head of the Dental Hygiene Unit at the National Institute of Health, began investigating the epidemiology of fluorosis. After a decade study, Dean and his team found that water containing fluoride at a concentration of one part per million ppm appeared to offer some caries protection while minimizing the extent of dental fluorosis. However, early studies on the impact of fluoridation on dental caries undertaken by Dean and his colleagues in a Chicago neighborhood and 12 other cities in four states were qualified. For example, that the inhibitory agent is the fluoride content of the water supply seems highly probable. An inspection of the range of dental caries experience associated with use of domestic water of different fluoride concentration discloses an inverse relation in general between the amount of dental caries and the fluoride concentration of common water supply. Relatively low dental caries experience rates are found associated with use of domestic waters whose fluoride concentrations has a range of one or more parts per million. Further, multi-site studies commenced in 1945 to determine impacts of fluoridated water on dental caries prevention and health also appeared to demonstrate a positive effect of water fluoridation with claims of reduction of dental caries up to 60% among almost 30,000 school children in Grand Rapids, Michigan, USA. However, these findings have been criticized for major methodological flaws, including data cherry picking and selection bias. Notwithstanding this and before the final results of these studies were known, the U.S. Public Health Service adopted the 1 ppm dose and supported the widespread introduction of community water fluoridation schemes in 1950. And of course, it's used in all of those other things as well, including, of course, the well-known addition to toothpaste. <clears throat> the United States led in, or, yeah, led in instituting artificial water fluoridation, led to its acceptance by the World Health Organization as an effective oral health intervention. At least 30 nations instituted artificial water fluoridation policies. However, a number of countries, including Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland, stopped fluoridating their water supplies due to concerns about safety and effectiveness. Currently, only about 5% of the world's population, 350 million people, including 200 million Americans, consume artificially fluoridated water globally. Only eight countries, Malaysia, Australia, USA, New Zealand, Singapore, and Ireland, more than 50% of the water supply artificially fluoridated. Over the past two decades, many communities in Canada, the USA, Australia, and New Zealand have stopped fluoridating the water supplies, and in Israel, the Minister for Health announced in April 2013 the end of mandatory water fluoridation. However, public health authorities continue to try and develop new community water fluoridation schemes. Adverse Impacts of Fluoride Ingestion on Human Health Classification of fluoride as a pollutant rather than as a nutrient or medicine is a useful starting point for analyzing the adverse effects of fluoride. No fluoride deficiency disease has ever been documented for humans. Indeed, the basis for setting an adequate intake of fluoride rests on the alleged ability of ingested fluoride to prevent tooth decay. However, since it is now known that the effect of fluoride is topical, the notion of an adequate daily intake is flawed. One of the key concerns about water fluoridation is the inability to control an individual's dose of ingested fluoride, which brings into question the concept of the optimal dose. Since the 1980s, numerous studies have identified that adults and children are exceeding these agreed limits, contributing to a rapid rise in dental fluorosis. The first sign of fluoride toxicity in 1991, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, in the USA measured fluoride levels and found that where water is fluoridated between 0.7 and 1.2 ppm, overall fluoride, total fluoride intake for adults was between 1.58 and 6.6 .6 mg per day, while the children, while for children it was between 0.9 and 3.6 mg per day, and that there was at least a six-fold variation just from water consumption alone. In a recent review of water fluoridation, the EU European Union Scientific Committee on Health and Environmental Risks highlight that young children are likely to exceed the upper tolerable limits for fluoride consumption in areas with water fluoridation greater than 0.8 ppm and using fluoride toothpaste. Although the estimates of ingestion are probably underestimated as they are based on ingestion from food and beverages in non-fluoridated areas. Warren et al. have highlighted the complexity of quantifying fluoride intake in areas where there is widespread water fluoridation and increased availability of fluoride-containing products. They argue that it is doubtful that parents or clinicians could adequately track children's fluoride intake 
and compare it with the recommended level, rendering the concept of an optimal or target intake relatively moot. Their conclusion supports earlier research that suggested that the term optimal fluoride intake should be dropped from common usage, as Ismail and Hassan, 2008, have argued, we believe that dentists should dismiss the misconception that there is a balance between dental caries and fluorosis because patients can accrue the benefits of topical fluorides without developing fluorosis and without systemic intake. The inability to control individual dose renders the notion of an optimum concentration obsolete. In the USA, a study in Ireland found that 90% of three-month-olds consumed over their recommended upper limits, with some babies adjusted over 6 milligrams of fluoride daily above what the Environmental Protection Agency and the WHO say is safe to avoid crippling skeletal fluorosis. Most recently, a study in the UK of fluoride levels found in tea concluded that fluoride concentrations can exceed the recommended DRI of 4 mg a day. In certain tea commodities under the minimal brewing time of 2 minutes, this study used non-fluoridated water but supports earlier findings by Koblar et al. who report that the adequate intake of fluoride from 70 kilograms, the adult consuming five cups of tea daily ranges from 25 to 210 percent, depending upon tea brand and whether the water is fluoridated. The main source of ingested fluoride to teeth is saliva, whose fluoride concentration is much lower than ingested fluoride. Furthermore, dental caries is essentially the outcome of bacterial infections modulated by physical, biological, environmental, behavioral, and lifestyle related factors such as high numbers of carcinogenic, carcin, cariogenic, cariogenic bacteria. Inadequate salivary or salivary flow, high intake of fermentable carbohydrates, inadequate access to dental services, poor oral hygiene, inappropriate methods of feeding infants, malnutrition, especially calcium and magnesium deficiency, and poverty. <clears throat> Fluoride exposure has a complex relationship in relation to dental caries and may increase dental caries risk in malnourished children due to calcium depletion and enamel hypoplasia, while offering modest caries prevention in otherwise well-nourished children. It has been demonstrated that at low friction loads, enamel hydro, hydroxypatite, hydroxypatite, that's hard to say, and fluoropatite appear to wear in the same way. However, at high friction loads, fluoropatite enamel flakes and wears catastrophically, leaving severely fractured enamel, whereas hydroxypatite enamel does not, as it is more adaptable to remodeling. This may be due to fluoride's disruption of cycles of demineralization and mineralization, which take place throughout the life cycle of teeth enamel. The adverse impact of fluoride in producing brittle teeth has been recognized in laboratory animals since 1933, and fluoride-induced brittle teeth were demonstrated to be worse with industrial fluoride such as sodium fluoride compared with naturally occurring calcium fluoride. Sauerhaber has analyzed the physiological conditions such as calcium and pH levels and systemic effects of ingested fluoride as well as the efficacy of ingested artificially fluoridated water on dental caries prevention. He highlights the important distinction that should be made between naturally occurring fluoride, calcium fluoride, CAF2, found in water supplies and added fluoride compounds, sodium fluoride, NAF, and fluorosilic acid, H2SIF6. His analysis is based on a detailed review of the effect of fluorides on physiological functions and concludes that there are harmful effects from adding artificial fluoride compounds to water supplies. He observes that most analysis of fluoridation rarely focus on detailed physiological analysis but rely on observational epidemic epidemiological epidemiological data to demonstrate the effectiveness which are rarely sensitive enough or examine potential issues of harm. One key exception to this was the review by the National Research Council in the USA for the Environmental Protection Agency, which took a weight of evidence approach to examining toxicological and physiological effects of fluoride on water. This review identified a number of potential and established adverse effects including cognitive impairment. That's our key word. Cognitive impairment. Hypothyroidism, dental and skeletal fluorosis, enzyme and electrolyte derangement, and cancer. In a meta analysis of 27 mostly Chinese based studies on fluoride and neurotoxicity, researchers from Harvard School of Public Health and China Medical University in Xinjiang found strong indications that fluoride may adversely affect cognitive development in children. But one study suggested that high fluoride content in water may negatively affect cognitive development. The average loss in intelligence quotient IQ was reported as a standardized weighted mean difference of 
which would be approximately equivalent to seven IQ points for commonly used IQ scores with a standard deviation of 15. While fluoride's effect on IQ in this meta-analysis did not reach statistical significance, the combined effect at population level is remarkable. A particular concern of the NRC committee was the impact of ingested fluoride on the thyroid gland, in a 2005 study, it was found that 47% of children living in a New Delhi neighborhood with average water fluoride level of 4.37 ppm have evidence of clinical hypothyroidism attributed to fluoride. They found borderline low F23 levels among all children exposed to fluoridated water. The mechanisms through which fluoride exacerbates hypothyroidism include competitive binding with iodine as well as synthesis obstruction of T3 and T4. These mechanisms explain the use of fluoride at doses above 5 mg a day in the treatment of hypothyroidism. Thus, fluoride-induced hypothyroidism is likely to be more common in iodine-deficient settings. Australian surveys indicate that the general Australian population is mildly deficient in iodine. Iodine-deficient children ingesting fluoride water have been found to demonstrate intellectual deficits even at water fluoride levels of 0.9 ppm. The most obvious and widespread impact of fluoride is dental fluorosis. In some cases where fluoride levels are very high or where there is prolonged ingestion at 2 ppm or higher, cases of skeletal fluorosis have been reported. Skeletal fluorosis is a chronic metabolic, metabolic bone disease caused by ingestion or inhalation of large amounts of fluoride. In regions with water fluoride concentrations over 2 ppm or among workers constantly exposed to fluoride in aluminum or fertilizer industries, skeletal fluorosis is common, uh, below 20% prevalence and manifested as joint pain in both upper and lower limbs, numbing and tingling in the extremities, back pains, and knock knees. Vertebral osclerosis, osteosclerosis, may result in spinal cord compression. In addition, an increase in bone mass due to fluoride ingestion or treatment for osteoporosis does not translate into improved bone strength, and high doses of sodium fluoride for osteoporosis treatment may increase the risk of vertebral fractures. Dental fluorosis smears skeletal fluorosis, Similar to counterintuitive histo histological changes in bone, the macro macroscopic appearance of increasing degrees of dental fluorosis was directly correlated to the degree of subsurface porosity. Despite such hist histological changes, suggesting that tooth decay prevalence may be higher among children with fluorosis, research findings have been mixed. There is no safe limit for fluoride ingestion in relation to dental fluorosis, but fluoridated levels exceeding 0.3 ppm have been associated with teeth mottling and discoloration. Since the initially proposed optimum fluoride intake of 1 mg a day from 1 liter of 1 ppm fluoridated water, new sources of fluoride have been introduced through dental care products, processed foods, and commercial beverages. These sources have increased average cumulative fluoride intake to more than 2 mg a day, with these higher levels of fluoride intake, dental fluorosis and other toxic effects noted above has, have also increased. Currently, about 41% of children in the United States where water has been fluoridated at an average level of 1 ppm have varying degrees of dental fluorosis, levels of over 50% in some fluoridated areas. The National Research Council's report on the health effects of ingested fluoride in the United States found that the prevalence of dental fluorosis is optimally fluoridated in optimally fluoridated areas, both natural and added in recent years range from 8% to 51% compared with 3% to 26% in non-fluoridated areas. This implies that while non-water sources of fluoride are likely to be consumed at the same level in fluoridated and non-fluoridated areas, and while the use of dental supplements is higher in non-fluoridated areas, fluorosis is significantly higher in areas where water is fluoridated. While the only controversial clinical complication of severe dental fluorosis is adverse psychological impact on well-being, self-esteem, and negative community perception of affected individuals' oral health, established clinical complications of skeletal fluorosis include arthritis, radiculopathy, uh, radiculomyelopathy, that's hard to say, quadriparesis, and pathological bone fractures. Fluoride is a known enzyme disruptor. For example, fluoride's anticaries effect is derived in part from its ability to derange the enzymes of car cariogenic bacteria. Fluoride can interfere by attaching itself to metal ions located at an enzyme's active site or by forming competing hydrogen bonds at the active site which is not exclusively just on the teeth. There are 66 enzymes which are affected by fluoride ingestion including P4, 
150 oxidases, as well as the enzyme which facilitates the formation of flexible enamel. A recent study at the effects of inorganic fluoride compounds on human cellular functions revealed that fluoride can interact with a wide range of enzyme-mediated cellular processes and genes modulated by fluoride, including those related to the stress response. Metabolic enzyme, metabolic enzymes, the cell cycle, cell-cell communications, and signal transduction. Due to high negativity of fluoride, it interacts actively with positively charged ions such as calcium and magnesium. In industrial settings, hydrofluoric acid poisoning is usually treated with intravenous calcium gluconate as such poisoning is associated with acute hypocalcemia. As with calcium, magnesium plays important roles in optimal bone and teeth formation. By competing with magnesium and calcium in teeth and bones, fluoride deranges the delicate bone formation and bone resorption processes. Such derangements and consequent intensity of fluoride's adverse effects on bone and teeth are amplified in malnutrition, calcium deficiency, and magnesium deficiency. Chronic fluoride ingestion is commonly associated with hyperkalemia and consequent ventricular fibrillation. There have also been a number of studies that link fluoride and cancer. More than 50 population-based studies have examined the potential link between fluoride water levels or fluoride levels in cancer have been reported in the medical literature. Most of these studies have not found a strong link between chronic fluoride ingestion and cancer. Well, go figure. It's probably some sort of monetary motive involved there. In a major review of the topic published in 1987, the International Agency for Research on Cancer labeled fluoride as non-classifiable as to their ability to cause cancer in humans, and that the studies reviewed have shown no consistent tendency for people living in areas with high concentrations of fluoride in the water to have higher cancer rates than those living in areas with low concentration. However, they concluded that the evidence was inadequate to draw conclusions one way or another, and that the evidence linking fluorides with cancer was deemed inadequate. The York, NRC, and SHARE reviews came to similar conclusions. However, population-based studies strongly suggest that chronic fluoride ingestion is a possible cause of uterine cancer and bladder cancer. There may be a link with osteosarcoma, highlighted as an area where there is evidence of problems requiring further research. Now, when we look at 21 USC, United States Code 2010 edition, Title 21 Food and Drugs, Chapter 9, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Chapter 9, Tobacco Products. In the subchapter, definitions 387, one, additive. The term additive means any substance, the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristic of any tobacco product, including any substances intended for use as a flavoring or coloring in any or in producing, manufacturing, packing, processing, preparing, treating, and packaging, transporting, or holding. Except that such term does not include tobacco or a pesticide chemical residue in or on raw tobacco or a pesticide chemical. Notice that last bit. All the first part of that doesn't make any difference because they state that pesticide chemical is not classified under the U.S. Code definition of an additive in tobacco products. And remember, fluorine is used in the production of pesticides. On the, the most natural of cigarette brands that you can buy at any commercial store today, the Natural American Spirit, in the orange package, it states it is 100% additive free. But as we just saw in that U.S. Code, they do not have to put pesticides as an additive and fluorine is used in the production of pesticides therefore anybody who smokes tobacco products will be inhaling pesticides will be inhaling fluorine and will be directly damaging their cognitive ability through inhalation which is the most effective measure to one of them anyway one of the most effective measures to uh induce adverse effects from toxins other than of course uh, intravenous or injection into the bloodstream. Also, statin drugs uh, <clears throat> increase the risk of dementia. It states, uh, according to Harvard Health, in 2012, questions surfaced when the FDA issued a warning that statin users have reported short-term cognitive impairment when taking drugs. Of course, statin drugs are well known as, as uh, 
in prescription, common prescription uh, today. Omeprazole, uh, omeprazole, however you say that, cognitive side effects. It states that, for instance, omeprazole led to the deterioration of visual and episodic memory, motor and mental response speed, new learning, short-term memory. Actually, I'm not sure if that says memory because it cuts off there. Lisinopril, cognitive impairment. A higher lisinopril concentration was associated with worse, worse, bleh, worse performance in several cognitive areas. Previous study also suggested a decrease in executive function among people taking lisinopril. That's from the National Institutes of Health, NIH.gov. Finally, we're going to go to a book, The Toxicology of Fluorine or fluorine, however you say that, Symposium Burn, 15 to 17, October 1962. Dr. T. Gordonoff, edited, uh, edited by Dr. T. T. Gordonoff, professor on der Universität Bern, so professor from the University of Bern. But this basically tells us that not only has the toxic and the effects, adverse effects of fluorine been well known, this is not old knowledge. In fact, these people did do their research and they did find the most effective means of inducing cognitive impairment, which is one of the primary motives of the CIA's mental control programs like MKUltra through the use of drugs and toxins. Main characteristics of toxicology of metalloids other than fluorine. With metalloids cited above and with all others to the exclusion only of fluorine, there is unity in their toxicology. This unity is the reflection of the ability of the living cell to split the bonds between carbon and those metalloids, or in the case of molecules from which the metalloid cannot be removed, to perceive the presence of the metalloid atom. Therefore, we can use the general terms of arsenicism, iodism, and bromism, etc. As being common to the toxicology of the organic and the mineral derivatives of arsenic, iodine, bromine, etc. for the practical purpose of therapeutic detoxification detoxification, this unity is of importance because it is possible to use the same toxifying agents against both mineral and organic poisoning. In the case of arsenic, for instance, 2.3 dimericapto 1 propanol BAL can be employed therapeutically not only for mineral arsenic poisoning, but also as protecting agents against organic arsenicals, such as the many war gases, lewisite, and even organic arsenical drugs. To summarize the situation, the features of the toxicology of these elements reflect three of the following characteristics. One, the dominant toxicity of the mineral ions compared to the organic derivatives. Two, the ease with which the organic derivatives of these elements are metabolized by the animal cells. And three, the similarity in the nature of the toxic manifestations between the mineral and the organic compounds of these elements. With fluorine, however, we encounter a unique element whose toxicology differs entirely from that of other metalloids. Main characteristics of organic fluorine toxicology. The biological activity of most of the poisonous organic derivatives of fluorine reflects the inability of the animal cells to split the carbon-fluorine bond in the course of their metabolization. As the dimensions of the fluorine atom do not greatly exceed those of the hydrogen atom, the enzymes of the living cells tend to fix organic fluorine-containing molecules almost as easily as they do the normal substrates. Once the possibility of these enzymes, those enzymes, being blocked by such a replacement process, and if the enzymes involved control important biochemical functions of the organism, the organic fluorine contain ing molecules, which they can fix, are able to act as powerful poisons. The most prominent example of such poisons is fluorocitric acid, which can block the function of the enzyme aconitas, aconitas by competing with normal citric acid one of the central met metabolites in the Krebs cycle. As the cycle evolves in the earlier step, the utilization of acetal groups, it is understandable that fluoroacetic acid could also act as a powerful poison to the cell. All the compounds which in the course of their metabolism can give rise to fluoroacetic acid will share that toxicity to a greater or lesser degree. This interference of fluoro Acetic acid in the Krebs cycle represents the best known example of lethal biosynthesis, according to the terminology adopted by Peters, who discovered this effect. Three, 
Enzymatic systems other than aconitase can be blocked by appropriate fluorinated fatty acids, and this explains why certain higher homeologs of fluoroacetic acid as well as some fluoro fluorinated alcohols and ketones are considerably more toxic than fluoroacetic acid itself. Table 2 lists the toxicities of some such compounds. From the same table, it can be seen for that the toxicity of fluorine-contaminated organic compounds in no way depends on their fluorine content. Difluoroacetic acid, for instance, being not appreciably toxic enough or toxic, although its halogen percentage is considerably greater than that of fluoroacetic acid. For each normal metabolite of the cell, it is possible to imagine at least one fluorine-containing antimetabolite. In the case of the amino acids, we know that the fluorinated phenylalanines are toxic substances because they interfere with the functions of phenylalanine. Similarly, the toxic 3 fluorotyrosine interferes with various functions of tyrosine. In microorganisms, 5 fluorotryptophan Berman and co-workers acts as a powerful antibacterial agent because it is a structural antagonist of tritophan itself. Even the biochemical functions of the basic substrates of heredity, i.e. the nucleic acids, can be upset by means of suitable fluorine-containing molecules such as 5-fluorosyl and 5-fluorourotic acid. Helderberg and co-workers. In all these examples, the toxic manifestations are due to the whole fluorine-bearing molecule or to its fluorine-bearing metabolites. Depending on the nature and the biochemical functions of the enzymatic system interfered with, the toxic phenomena will vary. For instance, the syndrome of intoxication by fluoroacetic acid will bear no relation to the toxic man manifestation of 3-fluorotyrosine or 5-fluorotritophan. For the type of fluorine toxicity, which covers all the organic fluorine-containing poisons, in whose molecule the carbon-fluorine bond is not split by the living cell and fluoride ions thus not produced, the term fluorotoxicosis is proposed. In summary, fluorotoxicosis is characterized by 1. The diversity of its biochemical and clinical pictures, each of which is specific to a group of fluorine-containing organic compounds and to the functions which are impaired by the substances of that particular group, say cognitive functions. <clears throat> 2. The fact that the nature of the poisoning has no connection with fluorine per se, but with the molecule as a whole, and therefore it is entirely independent of the amount of fluorine present in that molecule. So yes, fluorine dosage makes no difference. Three, its fundamental dissimilarity from the biochemical and clinical less lesions, which are observed in poisoning by fluoride ions. From the practical viewpoint, the therapeutics of fluorotoxicosis will vary with the molecule responsible for the poisoning. For instance, against fluoroacetic acid poisoning, use is made of generators, acetic acids such as triacetine, and against poisoning by 5-fluoroacyl uracil itself should be used. We now come to the other aspects of fluorine toxicology, namely that of fluoride ions. So I guess in this case, fluorine uh, levels don't mean so much as in the entire fluorine uh, grouping, all are toxic and you're still being toxified regardless of how much. But of course, well, not regardless, but if you ingest fluorine, then it's uh, going to have a toxic effect regardless of the level. Obviously, if you have more of it, then you'll have more toxicity. But any fluorine ingestion is toxic, regardless of the nonsense they say. This person clearly knows what they're talking about, and that's what they're saying. If you take intake any fluorine whatsoever, you are ingesting a toxin. Main characters of toxicology of fluoride ions. Owing to the electronic configuration of its atom, fluorine is always malevolent. Unlike the other halogens, which can which form can form different ions corresponding to different states of valency of the halogen atom, for example, to chlorine corresponds to the chloride ion, Ci. The hypochlorite ion, CiO, the chlorate ion, CiO3, and the perchlorate ion, CiO4. 
The toxicology of fluoride ions is well known and its limits well defined. And to designate its manifestations, the term fluorodotoxicosis is suggested. The biochemical and clinical symptoms of fluoridoxic fluoridotoxicosis seem to be linked mostly to the disturbances of two essential elements. Calcium, the most spectacular manifestations of fluoridotoxicosis are connected with impairments in the manifold functions of calcium in the body. And iodine, fluoride ions are known to interfere with the production of thyroid hair hormones. Quantitatively, the acute toxicity of fluoride ions, although notable, is considerably lower than that of most toxic fluorinated organic compounds. Fluoride toxicosis must be ascribed entirely to the fluoride ions per se and not to any possible incorporation of fluorine into organic components of the cell. Since in animal cells, no such molecule has ever been detected in fluoride poisoning. Although in the vegetable kingdom, the African plants, Dicapetalum, Chymosum and Chylatea toxicaria can synthesize fluorinated fatty acids, fluoroacetic acid in the former case, fluorooleic acid in the latter, from the fluoride ions contained in the soil. It is conceivable that the symptoms of fluoride toxicosis can be produced by appropriate fluorine containing organic molecules, i.e. those in which the carbon fluoride bonds are weakened enough by suitable chemical substitution to allow the halogen to be split off within the body. Such compounds could be, for example, fluorine containing aromatics like nitrofluorobenzins or 1-fluoroanthroquinone, in, in both of which the CF bond is loose. As the properties of fluorine-bearing organic molecules are yet not too well known, and as fluorine-containing organic compounds are more and more employed in therapeutics, it is important that before such drugs are put to use, estimations be made of the degree of stability of their carbon-fluorine bond during their passage through the animal body. One convenient method for this consists of detecting possible increases in the level of fluoride ions present in the animal body fluids. Another consists of performing very prolonged chronic toxicity tests and detecting any quantitative and quantitative modification of bones and teeth in animals dosed with fluorine-containing organic compounds. Such precautions are important, especially when the fluorine content of the molecule is high and when the drug is taken on a long-term basis. This is the case, for instance, of trifluoromethahydrochlorothicide. That's got to be uh, registered as one of the longest names in history. <laughs> and next to it, and trifluoromethachlorothicide. Yeah, say that 10 times fast. Two diuretics, which contain 17.2% and 17.3% fluorine, respectively. Two other drugs, trif trifluopromazine and trifluoperazine, which are neuroleptic agents, contain respectively 16.2% and 14% fluorine. Attention needs also to be paid to individual reactions such as organic fluorine containing molecules, especially as severe allergic reactions, have at times been observed in people who have been submitted to relatively small amounts of fluorinated mineral compounds. There is no doubt in the mind of the author, however, that such precautions taken the promotion of fluorine containing substances will represent an important asset for pharmacology. Yes, because it does want to upset the people that are paying the bill, such as the fluor company. However, it should be noted that this person is saying in all in all ways fluorine is a toxin and they put that in pesticides which gets into inhalation and in tobacco products but it also gets into all the food and the air and the water whether and of course they also put it into everything else and as said before it now goes into commercially bottled products including bottled water uh, bottled drinks um, soda. Virtually everything has fluorine in it. Medical Facility University of Pretoria, Pretoria Republic of South Africa. Chronic fluorine poisoning caused by the drinking of subterranean waters containing excessive quantities of fluorine. D.G. Stein, Dr. Med Vet D.V. S.E. Professor of Pharmacology. Introduction. With a limited time of 20 minutes at my disposal, I shall be able to touch only briefly on a few of the most important aspects of my research on chronic fluorine poisoning. In my publications, Stein 1-14, 
I have summarized the results of my field and laboratory investigations into chronic fluoride intoxication in man and animal conducted in the course of the past 25 years. In these publications, I have also made an attempt to refer to and discuss the most relevant points in some hundreds of publications made by the foremost investigators and writers on chronic fluoride poisoning. As early as 1938, I, Stein 1, reported the devastating effects excessive concentrations of minerals, especially fluorides, in underground drinking waters in the northwestern Cape province on the health of man and animal. At that time, I warned that if the necessary steps to prevent the drinking of water containing excessive quantities of fluorides were not taken, in years to come, many of the inhabitants, especially the children of that area, would show not only severe damage to their teeth, as they already did in 1938, but what is much more serious will suffer from serious disturbances of the bone system, legs, arms, back. The prediction was proved true when in 1959, we, Stein et al. 10, investigated a mysterious bone disease in some 200 children in the Kenhart District, northwestern Cape Province. At the time of writing, more cases of mysterious bone diseases, <coughs> quote, 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 unquote, suspected chronic fluorine poisoning among children in the northwestern Cape Province are being investigated. The results of this investigation will be made known as soon as they are available. In 1960, Einstein 13 investigated mysterious bone disease, quote, unquote, in children and adults in the Rodotan area. Potigatiersis district, Transvaal. Also, these cases proved to be fluorosis caused by the drinking of underground water containing excessive quantities of fluorine. At that moment, further cases of suspected fluorosis in children and adults are being investigated in an area not far from Rodotan, where chronic fluoride poisoning has already been diagnosed. The result of this investigation will be available in the near future. Symptoms of chronic fluorine poisoning. These can be multitudinous, as fluorine is a very active enzyme poison and is very prone to accumulate in the body. This halogen may therefore, and does, disturb the normal physiological action of, any en of many enzymes, apart from disturbing normal calcium phosphorus metabolism, and consequently precipitates a multitude of symptoms of disease. In this respect, I could state that Holman 15 pointed out that sodium fluoride is a potent catalyst poison and that catalyst inhibition is known to be associated with multigenic processes and with the development of viruses, and further that many proven carcinogenic agents can inhibit this enzyme. We must realize that any interference with the normal physiological function of enzymes in our bodies may and does have various serious repercussions on our health. However, I want to limit myself here only to two very important aspects of chronic fluorine intoxication, namely those concerned with the thyroid gland and with the bone system. When I, Stein 11 and 12, saw the high incidence of hypothyroidism, endemic goiter, in an area northwestern Cape Province where the underground drinking water supplies contain many times more iodine than is essential for normal human requirements and at the same time also contain toxic quantities of fluorine. My thoughts turn to a possible iodine-fluorine antagonism. In other words, that the fluorine has a thyrostatic effect. In experiments upon rats, I confirm the truth of this hypothesis, although I realize that in some parts of the affected area, excessive concentrations of calcium and iron in the drinking water have synergistic effects with fluorine on the thyroid. Einstein, 15 and 14, fully discussed fluorine iodine antagonism and amongst others also referred to Gordonoff's work with radioactive iodine. The results of our investigations into the incidence of endemic goiter fluorine induced in the northwestern Cape Province closely agree with the information supplied in the editorial 16 in the Journal of the American Dental Association. We do know that the use of drinking water containing as little as 1.2 to 3 parts per million of fluorine will cause such developmental disturbances in bones as osteosclerosis, spondylosis, and osteoporosis, as well as goiter. I'm not sure what goiter is. Maybe something to do with gout, but those are different spellings. The bone system, in large areas of the Republic of South Africa, the subterranean waters containing harmful concentration of fluorides with the result that chronic fluoride poisoning constitutes a serious problem. It was found, Stein et al. 10, that in the northwestern Cape province, the fluorine content of the drinking water, the affected children range from 3.6 to 13 parts per million parts of water. The affected children complained about pains in their legs within 8 to 12 years after having commenced drinking the water containing 3.6 to 3.8 ppm of fluorine.
while the higher concentrations of fluorine induced bone symptoms within three years, especially in the youngest children. Subsequent to our investigation in the northwestern Cape Province, I. Stein 13 investigated mysterious bone disease, quote unquote, in children and adults in the Rodotan area, Transvaal. On one farm where the borehole water contained 5.5 ppm of fluorine, the parents and their children complained of constant pains in their legs, especially when they walk or run. The parents also experienced pain in their back. Three children, brothers aged 5, 10, and 11 years respectively, who had since birth drunk borehole water containing 10 ppm of fluorine, showed serious bone abnormalities, short and markedly thickened feet and toes, thickened ankles, osteophytes. They had for years complained of pain in their legs and backs. The typical radiological picture of fluorosis was confirmed in a case brought to the Praetoria General Hospital. The teeth of all of the affected children showed pronounced mottling up to almost complete destruction. The overall picture seen in the affected children in the northwestern Cape Province and in the Rodotan area is the same with the difference that the children in the latter area were not as seriously affected as those in the former. All the affected children in the Rodotan area live in the cattle farms, with the result that they are much better fed, ample milk, meat, etc., than the underprivileged children in the northwestern Cape Province. The results of our investigations agree with, one, those of the studies of M.C. Smith and H.V. Smith, Editorial 16. In this editorial, it is stated, M.C. Smith and H.V. Smith, in their studies at St. David, Arizona, found that of the people using drinking water containing 1.6 to 4 parts per million of fluorine, at the ages of 12 to 14, 33% had caries. At ages 21 to 41, nearly 100% had caries. From 24 to 41, 50% had all teeth extracted and replaced by dentures, the authors concluded from this data that the teeth of the individuals of a community in which comparatively large amounts of fluorine are found, in this case, say 1.6 to 4 parts per million, are structurally weak. In some cases, the tooth structure being so impaired as to crumble on attempts to place fillings. And yet this substance is used to treat caries. Yeah, right. Because of our anxiety to find some therapeutic procedures that will promote mass prevention of caries, the seeming potentialities of fluorine appear speculatively attractive, but in the light of our present knowledge or lack of knowledge of the chemistry of the subject, the potentialities for harm far outweigh those for good. The statement that we do know the, the use of drinking water containing as little as 1.2 to 3 parts per million of fluorine can cause osteosclerosis, spondylysosis, and osteoporosis. A report by Lythe that spondylitis, osteosclerosis of the spine, has occurred with 5.9 ppm of fluorine in drinking water. Those of Okurse, who described severe osteosclerosis in natives in the Pretoria district as a result of drinking water containing 11.78 parts of fluorine per million parts. Information supplied in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Annotation 20, Epidemi epidemiological data and clinical and radiographic examinations of exposed industrial workers indicate that only when the fluoride content of water supply exceeds 5 to 6 ppm will its prolonged usage give rise to detectable osseosis changes and then only in the most susceptible persons. The statement made by Kerwin that the dose of 2.5 ppm or 5.5 ppm of fluorine has in certain locations caused a condition known as stiff back. More examples of publications which confirm the results of our investigations into fluorosis and which support my conclusions could be quoted, but the above number suffice to support my warning that there is, there is a possibility that under certain conditions mentioned below, concentrations of fluorine even below 1 ppm in drinking water constitutes a danger to the health of children. Further, the following statement by Largent is of great significance. By means of balanced experiments on human subjects, indirect evidence has been obtained that fluoride may be stored in human tissues over periods of months or years, during which as little as 3 milligrams as NAF has ingest, was ingested daily. Discussion and summary. I have given a brief summary of my investigation into fluorosis in man and animal in the Republic of South Africa in the course of the last 25 years. Special attention is given to the effects of fluorine on the thyroid gland on the tooth and bone system. The results of our investigations, especially those concerning the effects of fluorine on the teeth and bones, closely agree with those reported from other countries. From the results of our own investigations, as well as those of researchers, or research is done in other countries. It is clear that the drinking water containing as little as one to two parts per 
parts of fluorine per million parts may in certain circumstances cause serious disturbances of general health and especially in normal thyroid gland function and the normal processes of calcium phosphorus metabolism. Under most unfavorable conditions, it is possible that concentrations of less than 1 ppm of fluorine is drink in drinking water may be harmful, especially to children. The factors which govern the toxicity of fluorine in drinking water are 1. Length of period during which the water is drunk, other minerals present in the water, age, sex, state of health, occupation, diet, beverages, tea, wine, etc. Drugs taken, the use of fluorine containing insecticides on fruit and vegetables, and 11. In the case of artificial fluoridation of drinking water, the marked variation in fluorine concentrations which may occur at different points of the water reticulation systems. Undoubtedly, the two most important factors affecting the toxicity of fluorine are the diet and the great variations in the qualities or quantities of water drunk by different individuals under different conditions. In the latter case, it is known that certain individuals may drink more than 20 times the quantity of water than others do. A. Hydrofluorosis. Department of Medicine, Government Medical College, Patiala, India. Endemic fluorosis. A. Singh. Chronic fluoride intoxication is manifested by mottled enamel and diffuse osteosclerosis of the skeleton has been observed in different regions all over the world. In India, this condition was described in 1937 from the Madras state by Short and his colleagues. Our interest in this problem was aroused by the fact that we observed a number of cases of paraplegia, or paraplegia, presenting a well-defined de and almost uniform clinical picture among the almost same geographical region. Most of these cases had been model teeth and osteosclerosis of the skeleton. This observation prompted us to carry out an extensive epidemiological survey in two heavily endemic districts of Punjab, which is one of the northern states of India. The area of Punjab has a fairly hot summer, temperature touching 116 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and has a dry and sandy soil. The chief sources of water supply for the population are artificial wells. The fluorine content of drinking water varies from 2 to 18 ppm. The general hygienic standards are very poor, and the diet of most of the population is rather poor. The data presented in this paper are based upon a study of 409 cases of endemic fluorosis seen over a period of seven years, 1956 to 1962. Most of these patients were studied on the spot while carrying out the epidemiological surveys, while 41 cases were hospitalized and studied comprehensively according to a fixed plan. The biochemical estimation comprised fluorine, fluoride in blood, urine, and both ash of the patients and in the samples of water consumed by them. The estimation of serum CA and phosphorus, as well as urinary excretion of CA and inorganic phosphorus, was done in a number of cases to evaluate the mode of excretion. Since the urinary excretion provided some interesting findings, it was decided to study the total nitrogen, amino acid nitrogen, tyrosine, and its metabolites, and phenolic compounds in the urine of cases of endemic fluorosis. A limited Experimental study was done in the guinea pigs and monkeys to confirm the urinary excretion finding. The clinical manifestations of fluorosis may divide, be divided into the following subgroups. 1. Dental fluorosis. 2. Skeletal fluorosis, late and crippling. 3. Neurological fluorosis. 4. Visceral fluorosis. 5. Metabolic changes in fluorosis. Kidney, uh, A. Kidney and fluorosis. B. Calcium metabolism. And C. Protein metabolism. Dental fluorosis. Modeled enamel or dental fluorosis is a well-recognized entity and is observed wherever the drinking water contains more than 1 ppm of fluoride during the teeth eruptive period. It was divided into three grades. In the first grade, there were only white opacities of, pa or of patches on the enamel, while in the second stage, there is a distinct brownish discoloration, which is rather characteristic. In the third grade, there was considerable pitting. In addition to the changes described in the area surveyed, surveyed by us, the incidence of dental fluorosis was extremely high, as much as 80 to 90 percent of the population being affected. We observed two interesting changes in the dental roentgenograms, which have not been described in the literature before, i.e. hypercementosis and ap apical resorption of the roots. Skeletal changes. The changes in the skeleton are the most distinctive and characteristic feature of endemic fluorosis and are very easily observed by skyographic studies. The most striking changes were seen in the vertebral column, particularly in the cervical region. There was a uniform osteosclerosis and osteophytosis of the spine with beak-like lipping and a chalky white ground glass appearance. As a result of irregular oxytocin, 
there was considerable encroachment on the diameters of the spinal canal and invertebral foramina, which explained the development of neurological complications. Irregular periosteal bone formation was observed along the muscular and tendinous insertions and in the interosseous membranes of forearms and legs. The histiopathological changes of bone biopsies were also characteristic. It showed discorded lamellar orientation and poorly formed hyvergian system resembling the histiopathological changes of experimental fluorosis. The chemical composition of the bone was altered and it showed a fluoride content of 250 to 700 milligrams as against the normal content of 100 uh, to 20 milligrams. Neurological changes. The neurological complications of fluorosis resemble very much the features of cervical spindulosis and their pathogenic mechanism is also similar. Broadly speaking, they are the nature of radiculopathy. We observed 41 cases in a series of 409 cases. The radicular features result in muscular wasting and acroparesthesia and subjective pain referred along the nerve roots, while the myoclopathic features usually result in a complete spastic paraplegia. Objective sensory changes are observed in about 60% of the cases, while visceral disturbances are almost universal. The details are prescribed in the original paper, or described. Latent fluorosis. Whilst dental fluorosis is at once obvious, the skeletal fluorosis clinically does not become obvious until it advances into the stage of crippling fluorosis. However, radiological involvement of the skeleton is manifest at an early stage and is the only means of diagnosing latent fluorosis. Such cases are otherwise healthy and young adults who have as yet not received exposure to fluoride over a sufficiently long period. Their only complaint are vague pains in the joints and back and are usually labeled as suffering from rheumatoid or osteoarthritis or having vague neurologic or myologic pains. These, in reality, are symptoms of latent fluorosis, which on radiology may show osteosclerosis or be present even prior to the development of def definite radiological changes. Crippling fluorosis. This is nothing but a very advanced stage of fluoride intoxication, which has resulted from a continuous exposure of the inv individual to, two, to 20 to 80 milligrams of fluoride ion daily over a period of 10 to 20 years. 65 such cases were observed by us. The invalidism in such cases results partly from the neurological complications and partly from the deformities produced by ankylosis or various joints, of various joints. The advanced picture of crippling fluorosis with a quadriplegia and a kyphosed and bent spine with flexion deformity of the bones and hips provides a very grim picture. Systemic intoxication. We do not observe any significant systemic effect of fluoride intoxication. There was no evidence of underdevelopment or gross anemia or of thyroid deficiency. Detailed examination of cardiovascular system, including EK ECG, did not reveal any significant changes. Fluorosis and the kidney. The kidneys contain the second highest concentration of fluoride in soft tissues. It was therefore decided, decided to do as many kidney function tests as possible in case of fluorosis. The blood air urea was normal, 15 to 50 milligrams, in most of the cases, but its upper limit was raised. There was some degree of impairment of urea clearance and the ratio of inorganic phosphorus in the urine to that of inorganic phosphorus in blood was raised. Similarly, there was an amino aciduria of the renal type. All these indicate a subtle disturbance of renal function, which needs further elaboration. Moreover, it was observed by us that the urine showed rather characteristic changes in color to dark brown from above downwards when it was allowed to stand for a few hours. The excretion of phenolic compounds and tyrosine was examined, and it was shown that the excretion of tyrosine and metabolites was found to range from 190 to 382.4 mg per 24 hours with an average 174 mg in cases of fluorosis against the normal of 125.6 mg. Similarly, the value of conjugated phenols and phenolic acid excreted in 24 hours urine was grossly in excess of normal values. The aminoaciduria detected in such cases was confirmed by uh, chromatography and was shown to be due to a failure of renal tubular absorption because of the serum content of amino acids was normal. 
The details are shown in Table 1. An extensive number of biochemical data has been collected. A summary of this is shown in the following two tables, 2 and 3. Calcium, phosphorus, and pyroth parathyroid. We investigate the calcium and phosphorus metabolism in detail in 28 cases because there is a remote similarity between fluorosis and hyperparathyroidism, depending as it does on the mobilization of calcium and phosphorus excretions. Serum CA was found to range from 9.2 to 13.5 milligrams, as shown in Table 2, compared to 9.1 milligram of normal controls. The amount of inorganic phosphorus was found to range between 1.9 to 5.5 milligrams. The urinary calcium was not increased, but the amount of urinary inorganic phosphorus was considerably increased. The cause of this greater excretion is probably impaired renal excretion. Social and preventative aspects. Various methods have been utilized for defluoridation in the water supply. In our experience, the canal water or deep drilling of the wells has yielded water containing less than 1 ppm of fluoride, and these measures have been actually adopted in two villages. It is proposed to extend this to other endemic areas. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. Join my Discord channel, and there are free books available at the links. And if you so desire, you may support my work at any of the other um, the options available, PayPal, Cash App, Buy Me a Cup, etc. Thank you.